Next week, we'll celebrate Earth Day. And for many, that means a visit to some of the wild places where the planet's natural beauty has been preserved. In many cases, those lands and their inhabitants are thriving not because they're left idle, but because they're used by hunters and fishermen who are responsible for the majority of state conservation funding and are deeply committed to keeping these areas undeveloped and well cared for. I had the chance to head into the wild to talk to some of these everyday conservationists about the important role they play and the future of our nation's most scenic spaces. In one of the most picturesque parts of America, home to two national parks, an array of wildlife. Come on. That's a good looking bird. And the foothills of the Blackfoot River. I want that thing coming straight over the back of your head. Okay. Montana mountain man, Lan Tawney, tried to teach a novice. Set, set. Like I'm gonna tell you that. How to fly fish. Good cast, dude, <laughs> holy cow. Not an easy feat. I'm a fly fisher woman. He's got that right. <laughs> But as founder of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, he's used to it. Anybody can do this. This water belongs to everybody in America. They have public access to this water. This fishing hole was a favorite of his parents, conservation lobbyists trying to preserve the native west. When you are out in the outdoors like we are today, you get an appreciation of that when we have that eagle that was up in the trees or you know when we catch a fish ultimately or haven't <laughs> when we catch a fish yeah we got a fish oh we got a little baby fish like it's like you have a connection now to this river that not if you weren't fishing you wouldn't necessarily have and so when people are out there then they want to make sure that, that is there for them and for future generations and so if your inability to fish or to hunt the idea of conservation goes away pretty quickly it's like we have to be participants in this whole system tawny knows is both hunter and gun owner his status as protector of the environment might come into question, but he believes all three can coexist. It really is the Bambi effect. How do you tell someone who comes from like that perspective that hunting's a bad thing, that what you're doing, something that actually helps the environment? So you bring up Bambi. Are there some hunters like that? Absolutely, but they're ostracized. Like, you know, that idea of, of take and, and not being connected to those animals. You know, as a hunter, it's regulated, it's scientifically managed. And so this isn't like I can go shoot as many deer as I want. You know, there's rules and regulations around that. I'm required to eat those animals. And I would say that feeding my family, that connection I have to that animal, I'm in their habitat. When I'm hunting, I'm not an observer, I'm a participant. And so I know more about them and I have such an appreciation for them. And so I want to make sure that those animals are going to be out there forever and that they're going to thrive. That symbiotic relationship began over a century ago with President Theodore Roosevelt. An outdoorsman and trophy hunter, he also witnessed its detrimental impact, realizing our nation's natural resources were in limited supply. So while setting aside 240 million acres to establish our national park system, he also helped in the practice of market hunting. It is so beautiful. Setting the tone for our conservation ethos. How awesome it is that we get to be the caretakers right now and play a part in all this public lands that's available to everybody. We're playing a role that's really been around for about 150 years. By 1937, the hunting community lobbied Congress to tax the industry. And today, that legacy funds 60 percent of state-based conservation efforts through the sale of hunting and fishing licenses, as well as excise taxes on gear, guns, and ammunition. I paid for my little fishing license. How did I put into the conservation effort? When you pay for your fishing license, the money for your license goes to the Fish and Wildlife Service. Martha Williams leads the agency. And then that goes out to states and partners to make sure that we know the fish populations can be healthy, to make sure that they're boat ramps and there's access for you to be able to get on the river or the stream. It makes sure that you have, hopefully, a really great experience. Williams acknowledges hunters pay far more into the system. They're just 4% of the population, but their numbers have been on the decline, down from 17 million in the mid-1970s to 11.5 million in 2016. That is, until the pandemic turned America's attention back to the great outdoors. 
what we saw across the board in all states was um, more and more people getting outside, more and more people using our public lands. What are you seeing in terms of the money brought in to conserve public lands? We have seen a continuing increase in the excise taxes. We've seen more money come in from ammunition sales, from hunting and tackle gear. We've seen those revenues increase. But that trend may not be permanent. Isn't there though a concern that as fewer hunters participate in hunting season, that that may affect your bottom line? I mean, yes. In the conservation effort. Yes, it does. Are you looking at ways to change this, this system? We are always looking at other ways to fund conservation in this country beyond hunting and fishing excise taxes. And then add to that, always wanting to build and bring more people into hunting and fishing so that it continues. So basically, that, you're widening, you're, you're, you're- Absolutely, we wanna widen the tent. Widening that tent, she says, might include levying a so-called backpack tax on recreational users of public lands, hikers, bikers, and kayakers. Others believe the federal government should foot more of the bill, but Congress has yet to act on the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. For now, you're paying the price of keeping our forests and our rivers and our streams healthy. Gladly we're paying the price. Gladly we're paying the price. I think we wear that on our sleeve, but it's not enough. And so how are we going to continue to fund our wildlife agencies that are in charge of managing these species? How are we going to continue to fund um, the restoration and conservation that needs to happen? But what I love even more is this idea of people that don't hunt and fish wearing that on their sleeve like we do. I love that. Yeah, not everybody likes the idea of a backpack test. Chief among them, REI, the uh, outdoor outfitter. They say, you know, they put in, along with hunters and fishermen, they put in about 125 billion, right? The federal government doesn't put anywhere near that much money. They just collect it and then pass it on. And they say that that's where the money needs to come from, that the federal government should share more of the pie in itself coming from our general operating fund. Right. So we'll see what happens, but Congress has yet to act. Interesting, thanks Michelle.